Hello team. Um, welcome to the organization of the neck. Um, I'm Lily. I think if I'm right, this is your first week of um, head and neck anatomy, which is actually really exciting because I really enjoyed head and neck anatomy. Um, it was very overwhelming at the start and you look through everything you have to learn and you just really stress but that's actually not an efficient use of your time because you'll you actually have heaps of time to learn all of this and the like clinically important stuff will be stressed to you head and neck as a whole is not super super clinically relevant besides facial nerves and obviously you still have to know the anatomy of the head and neck um but it's actually if you love anatomy it's a great kind of section of time um, and at the start, why I found head and neck anatomy and most people find it quite hard is because it's so um, interrelated, all the systems. So trying to learn one section, you feel very lost because you have to then learn this to then learn that. But at the start, it's going to, as I said, be quite overwhelming. But over time, it's going to slowly come together. And I think by the time you start doing like learning the larynx and like more... Um, of like the mouth, things should start coming together, um, but it will take lots of time. And I think the biggest help is going through the actual atlases. So I really recommend ne um, Neda's atlas. Um, Dalian Moore has very good clinical anatomy. And then also you can do your flashcards. And then I also found it quite helpful, Gray's Anatomy, the um, clinical re review book, which has lots of questions. The PSPs from my year were great. And also the lectures are, oh, it's always hard to learn anatomy over a lecture because um, really you just have to learn the stuff. You kind of have to memorize some things, but always try think about relationships um, as we know they matter. And feel, please feel more than free to reach out to me on my Facebook messenger or just email me. I'm more than happy to respond. Um, and I guess let's dive into it. So we're doing organization of the neck. So we're going to start with the skeleton and the muscles. So very basics of the neck is essentially it just connects your head to your body. Um, probably don't have to tell you that, but, um, we're essentially going to go from bones to muscles, fascia and spaces. And then I don't even think we do any vasculature in this one. Um, but that's the main thing. And side note, I probably think the most important thing is the actual fascia spaces because they'll definitely ask you a question on that. We'll, and that was very confusing when they taught it to us. We'll go through that in all your anatomy tutes. Um, the neck is made up of your cervical spine, so your cervical vertebrae. And as we can see here, your actual cervical vertebrae aren't the same as what we learned in the back, so your lumbar and thoracic um, vertebrae. They... Um, We'll go a bit more into it, but especially your first two aren't very typical. I thought these are some good clinical landmarks to know. Some of this stuff won't actually make sense yet because we're not sure what those things are yet, but come back to these slides. So the clinical landmarks of where the um, common carot carotid bifurcates, where the larynx and trachea separates from the pharynx, pharynx and esophagus. And also knowing that C3 is the hyoid book where the hyoid bone is typically located when you're next in a neutral position. Um, but probably more for like a clinical skills is that knowing that you can palpate um, vertebrae C2, 6, and 7. And you can even do that on yourself. Just feel the back. Let's go into the bone. So starting with our C1, the atlas. So there's actually no, there's actually no vertebral body in the atlas. This one's your atlas here. And as you can see, there's no body like this one here. This is your kind of classic vertebral um, cervical vertebrae. Um, and you have your body here. You have your um, transverse foramen, which is important. This is where the um, vertebral arteries run through. I think this might have been a question, maybe in one of the our anatomy quizzes, that the vertebral artery actually doesn't run through the um, C7 um, transverse foramen, even though C7 does have transverse foramen. Um, 
So this is your normal uh, cervical vertebrae, but then we have our atlas, which is where the kind of skull sits on top of, sits on, onto these occiput kind of, and can go backwards and forwards. And then what's very cool is you have your C2. So the C1 is your atlas and you have your C2 of your axis. And the axis has this thing called the odontoid process, this kind of uh, vertical bony structure here. And this attaches to the back of the um, axis, atlas like that. So you have your uh, odontoid, this is like a, you're looking from the side, you have your odontoid process here from your axis, which attaches to the back of your atlas. And it's actually only held in place by ligaments, the A-line cruciate ligaments. Um, hyoid, it's not necessarily an important bone for the neck per se, but it's more important for the neck as a whole in that it allows for muscle attachments and it holds everything up. Um, I'm not sure when you actually get this lecture, but all about, I think it's probably the start. Um, our hyoid bone actually comes from two arches, arch three and two, mainly from arch three. So everything except the lesser horn comes from arch um, three. And here is a great diagram of the neck bones. This diagram here, very confusing, lots going on. I love this picture because I think it shows very well um, the important part of our um, neck bone, cervical vertebrae. We can see that really long C7 spinous process. Um, a good tip is that if you're looking at a vertebrae and you're not sure which where it's from, if it has a bifid, so two spinous processes, can't really see here, but imagine it's split in the side. I'll go back a couple of slides. Yep, here, the spinous process is actually bifid. So these are the typical features of cervical vertebrae. Thoracic has um, typical features, same as um, lumbar, but they have more of an oval-shaped body. It's a bit questionable how oval. Let's say overly squarey. Then you have the long bifid spinous processes, so they're quite long as we saw, and you have those transverse foramen where our vertebral artery runs. Obviously, no other um, kind of artery... Uh, Verte no other vertebrae need to house that vertebral artery. So no other vertebrae will have the transverse foramen. Um, this is a great image, I think, of just showing how they sit on top of each other. And we can see our superior facet joints, our inferior facet joints. Um, we can see the spinous processes. Um, you can really see how you would able to have flexion and extension here, but also how it's somewhat limited as well. Out of the sides is where our nerve roots are running. This is all just revision. We have our vertebral artery and the venous plexus kind of coming through here. The dense or odontoid process attaching to that um, atlas, the C1, this is our C2. So you can imagine this is essentially a pivot joint. So from here, you can have your rotation. So rotation happens at C1 and C2. So C1 rotating over that odontoid or dense. And then actually the extension and um, flexion of your head is occurs at your um, C1 facet joints and the occipital condyles, which are, imagine, if just behind here. So the actual skull moving as well as parts of the neck as a whole. That's just placed here, um, what movements are allowed at the neck and also the maybe anatomical features of um, atlas and axis. Moving on to the muscles, so you were going to have a lot of muscles in your neck. There's lots I've put in. There's a whole section that I would never learn. I've just put them in for completion. If you want to be an ENT surgeon, maybe one day you'd know them, but I don't think it's very important now, but we'll go over the important ones. So first, Imagine we're dissecting a body. We're starting from anterior to the front and we're going to go closer and closer to um, the into the neck. So our superficial layer from the anterior neck is your platysma. If you go like this, you can kind of feel the platysma really. It's very superficial within that first kind of compartment of your neck, which we'll touch on a bit later. Um, platysma is innervated by your facial nerve because it actually does um, some of your must uh, allows for your facial expression muscles lots of this nerve innovation i would definitely come back to i'd revise the, all the um muscles 
of the neck, what innervates it later when you have a bit more of an understanding of the nerves and kind of the common patterns that they do. Number one thing to know is the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the SCM, and this is innervated by your accessory nerve. There's also a little bit of cervical branches, but essentially just accessory nerve, so your cranial nerve 11. And you also have a subclavius. Subclavius very small. Who even really cares about it? Main ones here, platysma and sternocleidomastoid. And your first anterior. And your sternocleidomastoid allows for moving your head side to side like that. And when you do a cranial nerve examination, you'll actually test that. Um, then you have just below these muscles, your um, suprahyoids, and then we'll also go into the infrahyoids. Suprahyoids aren't necessarily super important. They assist with some movement of the jaw, um, which obviously would allow us to swallow. And they're called suprahyoid because this is the hyoid bone, bone here. And they're all above it, and you can imagine the infrahyoids all below. Um, these you probably will review when you do a bit of anatomy of the mouth, um, but they are obsessed with this digastric muscle here, which essentially arches between the stylohyoid. Um, and why they really love this, it's a good anatomy, is that the anterior part is innervated by the inferior alveolar um, nerve, which is a subcomponent of cranial nerve five, so the trigeminal nerve. Um, and then the posterior part is actually a facial nerve innervated muscle. Um, so I'm sure they will ask you that in an anatomy quiz or something like that. The rest of the um, muscles, not super important to know, just know roughly where they run. Um, and when you get to kind of to the tongue, they'll be a bit more relevant. All right, now infrahyoid muscles. I actually think these are quite important because they, um, these are all obviously below the hyoid muscles, why infrahyoid? And um, why I think these are important is I recall them asking us a question about getting to the trachea and um, essentially what you have to cut through to eventually get there. And um, these are important, therefore, to be able to know the order. Um, but Actually, they're all quite self-explanatory because they essentially say where they run because sternohyoid goes from the sternum. Where is this? Oh, I here, the screen one. Goes from the sternum, just below here, up to the hyoid bone. That makes sense. Then you have the sternothyroid. It goes from the sternum, so it originates the same from the hyoid, to the thyroid. Then you have the thyrohyoid, so from the thyroid to the hyoid bone. And then you have the omenohyoid. So that just comes under there why this is actually important or not important to know but easy to know is that you have all of these muscles and if you think where they what it's innovating or where it's running you can just understand the order so hyoid is above and it makes sense that for it to innovate um or connect from the sternum to the hyoid it has to run kind of the top and you couldn't really have something going from the um thyroid which is kind of more um, posterior running in front so that's how you know that those are more of the the sternohyoid the thyrohyoid um, muscles are deeper um, I think this is a great picture to show a bit more of the deeper muscles there um, yeah and these kind of just lower the hyoid so they're kind of opposing to the um, suprahyoid muscles and they allow as well as um, kind of opposing that action they also allow for the maintenance of the structures of your neck and a bit of um, small action of flexion and extension also these are all innovated mainly by the answer the cutlass which is essentially just a very complicated looking thing which is just a lot of um, cervical nerves running together forming loops innovating this innovating that um, again not very important to know what innovates these muscles. Scalene muscles they really like. So these are very deep. These are essentially attaching to your um, the vertebral um, transverse processes. Um, they really like them essentially because it gives a bit of anatomical relationship to other structures, aka the upper limb. 
due to where they connect. So you have three kind of groups of scalene muscles. These are um, uh, accessory muscles of respiration. So when you're doing your respiratory exam and you're trying to assess someone's breathing state, you can really see these muscles flex and tense if someone's having an asthma attack, for example, and they really need to um, try increase their breathing they'll use these and you'll be able to see this. So these are the scalene muscles. These are the muscles of accessory muscles of respiration that you're looking for. Um, so you have your anterior, middle, and posterior. Your And they're essentially quite self-explanatory. I don't think it's super important to know what's um, innovating what. I think this image here is most important, knowing that kind of you have your um, subclavian vein, then you have your anterior scalene, then your um, subclavian artery, post, uh, middle scalene, and then your brachial plexus running between your um, middle scalene muscle and your anterior scalene muscle. There's other um, muscles of the neck, but who cares, honestly? This is it. We can see our SCM here. Great muscle. Here's our trapezius muscle as well. This muscle and this muscle are innovated, so your trapezius and your SCM are innovated by your um, cranial nerve 11, so your accessory nerve. These are all your infrahyoids, suprahyoids here. Here you can see the digastric. So this is your, the front part is innervated by, your anterior part is innervated by the inferior alveoli um, nerve, which also innervates most of the other suprahyoid muscles and your posterior is a trigem is um facially facial nerve innervation here you can see the prone gland this is the mandibular bone um yeah so this up here is the prone this is the um submental um gland here's a bit of your posterior um muscles scalings here Longus coli and longus capitis here. Again, very not important to know. Um, this is just for completion. Do I really don't think at all you need to know that, but that's fine. This is just some key anatomical structures of where things run, um, which would be great to review kind of towards the end um, when you kind of bring all those big... Um, relationships together um, just knowing where these kind of key structures are running and um, we've already touched on how the um, brachial plexus runs between the middle and anterior scalene um, and phrenic nerve knowing that it goes anterior to the scalene muscle which actually makes sense um, but yeah I'm not sure if you guys actually have gotten to any of these relationships yet Head and neck is very all about knowing relationships and that only comes with time and looking at lots of pictures and looking at things individually and then bringing them together. Now we have um, the anatomy department's favourite topic of the neck to talk about, which is the um, face, the spaces and the fascia. I remember maybe it was like our third, oh, probably our first ever lecture on head and neck. Some guy gave the most ridiculous lecture on fascial fascia um and I was never been more confused in my life and it was very confusing because I actually had no concept of first of all what fascia was but also anything in the neck um he also went into lots of detail about specific spaces within these fascias um, I'm going to talk about the main fascias and the main spaces He'll, and if you guys get the same lecture, you'll probably also get a lot, a lot of spaces. But I don't actually think any of those are relevant besides the ones I pointed to. So let's start with just the neck in general. So we've done the bones, we've done the muscles. As we can see here, the muscles themselves create lots of kind of um, natural triangles in which certain things um, in the certain um, anatomical structures run. And this also assists more in surgery, knowing where you are, knowing where to find something. Um, but we will touch on these triangles. Let's just review a bit of the anatomy before we begin. So anterior, posterior, you have your trapezius here. 
and you have your SCM here, so your sternocleidomastoid. Here we have our digastric, remember, innervated by those two muscles. Um, here's our hyoid bone. So everything below is those infrahyoids all here. And here are all your suprahyoids above here. So let's get into these um, anatomical triangles. So we first have our anterior triangle, which is here, this part. And the posterior is this back part here. Pretty self-explanatory. Let's go into it. So anterior triangle of the neck. This is bordered by an imaginary line down the middle here from the middle of your mandible to your sternum. Doesn't actually exist. You have your SEM as your kind of posterior lateral border. Um, and the mandible up here creating that superior border. Important things to know that kind of run within this space, kind of behind this space. Um, knowing that you have your hyoid bo bone, um, carotid sheath, your glossopharyngeal and hypoglossal nerve are probably the most important. There are further divisions, not that important to know. I think it's just important to know what the borders of the anterior triangle are because eventually it just makes sense what's within that border if you know what are the structures within this anterior triangle once you know the border and also once you begin learning a bit more anatomy. This is a great photo of kind of if you cut away all the musculature, what would be there? Um, great. Now, posterior triangle of the neck. This is behind the SCM. So you have your SCM as your anterior border. Your posterior border is the trapezium. And your clavicle is just what makes up that inferior border. The really main thing to know here is that the accessory nerve runs within this. And it's quite superficial. So if you're going to do a cut here, trying to access something, maybe um, go up through the, um, uh, you know, external jugular into the brain, do some um, kind of interventional radiology there. It's very likely you can cut the accessory nerve and that's going to impair your ability to turn your head depending on where you've cut it and if it's innervated your SEM there. Also knowing that the brachial plexus kind of exits those kind of inferior roots, exit along that border. That's about it. There's some further subdivisions, but who cares also about that? Um, yeah, and it's associated with the auxiliary inlet, which is kind of connecting your neck to your upper limb. This is a better photo showing how superficial that um, accessory spinal nerve is running just there. You can see it's running just within that kind of first fascial layer. So it's quite exposed if you were to cut it. These other branches are parts of your um, cervicalis, which is your um, kind of cervical nerve roots kind of forming things and running off and innovating a couple more of those muscles of the neck. Um, cool. So we've done our spaces. Also, just so you know, the picture on the right has the deeper nerves. Um, but... Now we're onto the fascia. As I said, we had that. I personally had this lecture. I'm not sure if you guys will as well, where they went to a thousand spaces within the fascia. But let's just break it down. I'm trying to think if you guys have done any fascia. Oh, you would yeah, a bit. Essentially, fascia is just something that wraps around um, muscles. So your muscles aren't really floating in space and rubbing on each other. And why these are important is because it assist in the organization of the neck and assist when you're doing surgery or whatever where you are but also some of these fascial planes essentially create a potential space because you can imagine you have fascia muscle and fascia but there's the fascia and the muscle aren't necessarily glued together so there's times where you might have an infection let's say in your mouth and we'll get to this but there's certain parts of fascia that connect your mouth all the way to your heart so you can actually get a infection running through these fascial planes which is what we'll get to which is essentially the anatomical importance of this this is a very um good picture i think i'm just going to walk us through it so anterior is up here the bottom is in inferior you have your skin which is that first really light gray it's all your subcutaneous tissue and this actual first muscle here is your platysma so we said if you do this action here, 
you can feel that platysma. It's very, very superficial muscle, not even within the fascia. Then you have your first fascia, your superficial or investing fascia, which wraps around or kind of splits around and engulfs your SCM, so your sternocleidomastoid, and also your trapezius at the back. Cool, I think that's pretty chilled. The next fascia you have is your pretracheal fascia. So you're cutting through the fascia to then get um, to the tra uh, trachea. This is made up of, it goes around your, infra, these are your infrahyoid muscles. This is your thyroid, trachea, esophagus. These are your recurrent laryngeal nerves. They'll be very important. This is also, this green part here is also part of your pretracheal fascia. So all of this here, which you can see with my, my, my mouse, we're going around. This is all your pretracheal fascia. Then you get a bit layer down. This is your carotid sheath, technically part of your prevertebral. So your vertebra is here. There's a spinal little cute spinal cord in the vertebral column. Um, but your fascia engulfing this the vertebrae, all those posterior muscles at the back that no one really cares about. And technically your carotid sheath is part of your prevertebral fascia but we like to consider that as slightly separate and this is your internal carotid artery vagus nerve internal jugular vein and it's internal because it's within this carotid sheath um great now let us go on to our um this kind of um sagittal view of this fascia Essentially, it's the same thing. You have your investing fascia here, most superficial layer. This is your prevertebral. It's within the vertebra. It's engulfing all of those vertebral bodies. This here is the alar fascia, which is the part, front part of the vertebral fascia. Bacopharyngeal is the back part of your pretracheal fascia, which is all here. Great. Let's go into it. So from anterior to posterior, again, just revising this. You have your investing fascia, pretracheal fascia, which engulfs all of this, and then your prevertebral fascia, which also encompasses the carotid sheath, but we also like to think of it separately. Let's go into the investing fascia. So once again, this is the fascia that goes all around your whole neck, and it splits to include the sternocleidomastoids at the front and the trapezius at the back. It also splits around the parotid gland, which is important only in the sense of what's actually within the parotid space. Again, you'll touch on this later because in anatomy, they always stress and you always end up getting ingrained to your brain, the important parts. But the parotid space, this is where the facial artery goes into all five of its branches. This, what I'm doing with my hand will make sense when you get to the facial nerve. But um, the parotid gland, the, within the parotid space, you have your parotid gland, your external carotid artery branches, lymph nodes, facial vein, and retromandibular vein. So facial vein, sorry, facial nerve and retromandibular vein are probably the most important things to know with, that's within that parotid gland space. And just knowing that the investing fascia splits around these and ends around that um, parotid gland. So it doesn't fully engulf that whole parotid gland. And if you have something called mumps, you can get very big parotid glands and that's kind of stretching your investing fascia. Um, trying to think anything else important here. This is your sub on this left picture here is your sub mandibular um, gland and it does the same thing but actually fully engulfs there not actually important really next we have our pretracheal fascia this is everything in this teach me anatomy i think teach me anatomy has very good basic um pictures to really show and understand to really show you the beginnings and then you kind of go into the more of the atlases and anatomy textbooks to go have a bit more deeper understanding this is a great photo so this whole red thing is your pretracheal um fascia 
and it splits into multiple things to cover multiple aspects and muscles. So these are all your infrahyoid muscles here, which make up your anterior. You then have kind of your middle um, fascia of part of the pretracheal fascia, which goes around the thyroid as well as the trachea and the esophagus. And then you also have this back part, which is known as the buccopharyngeal, which then behind it has the alar fascia. We're going to go into all of these spaces um, again, um, but this is the main thing. So this part on the left, I'm going to touch on in a bit. Next, we have our prevertebral fascia. Again, great diagram by Teach Me Anatomy, this purple line here engulfing all of your posterior muscles except for your trapezius which is in the investing fascia yes right um this goes from the superior mediastinum to the base of the skull contains what you would assume is contained within here so you have your vertebral bodies you have the things um that, your spinal cord you have your vertebral arteries and veins you also have your phrenic nerve within here um and this danger space, very important. We will get to that in a second, but essentially that is just immediately anterior to this prevertebral fascia. Last kind of space is your carotid sheath. Um, not super important to know every single thing that runs within your carotid sheath. Just know that it has the common carotids, which eventually goes into the internal carotid and internal jugular. And then also some other nerves travel with it specifically also the vagal nerve. I think they stretch that this the arrangement is that the artery is medial, lateral is the vein and posterior is the nerve, the vagus nerve. But I think it kind of twists throughout. So not super important to know that by memory, just knowing the relationship of the carotid sheath to the both the pretracheal and prevertebral fascia. And it's just behind the SCM. So your SCM is really protecting those um, really key vasculature structures. All right. So this is kind of the key part of this whole fascial, fascial, fascial spaces and um, organization. So again, we're looking at a sagittal cut of our um, neck. Starting from the front here, I'm really hoping everyone can see my mouse. We have our skin. Then we're going to have our platysma. Then we're going to have our investing fascia. Then we're going to have all the pretracheal fascia. This here is the thyroid. This here is the um, larynx. The back is the esophagus there. This green thing here is known as the buccopharyngeal fascia. The buccopharyngeal fascia is essentially just the posterior part of the pretracheal fascia. So we have our buccopharyngeal lining the back of that esophagus, which makes sense when we remember what was in that pretracheal part. Behind the buccopharyngeal fascia, we have the retropharyngeal space. This is essentially going anterior to posterior, this little legend at the bottom. So buccopharyngeal fascia, retropharyngeal space. Then we have the alar fascia. The alar fascia is essentially a the most anterior part of the prevertebral fascia, a little outpouching that also sometimes can connect the carotid sheets. So buccopharyngeal fascia, which is the most posterior part of the pretracheal fascia, retropharyngeal space, alar fascia, which is just the most anterior part of the prevertebral space, posterior to the alar fascia. So between the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia is a potential space known as the danger space. We'll get onto why this is the danger space. It's essentially the danger space because it connects the um, most inferior part of the diagram, diaphragm, all the way up to the your um, skull. And why this is, can be really important is there's not actually much in there besides fat, a couple um, lymph nodes, but essentially you can allow for infection to spread, to seed from one of these locations and spread all the way up from your diaphragm. So possibly you could have 
essentially in a pneumonia, you could have a pleural effusion, somehow gets to that space, travels all the way up, not much limiting it, all the way into your brain. You can imagine that's quite dangerous. So buccopharyngeal, retropharyngeal space, alar fascia, danger space, then you have your prevertebral fascia, and within your prevertebral space is all those vertebral bodies and everything else, those muscles that we chatted about. Also on the right is a great diaphragm. Knowing, I think, that the retropharyngeal space is between the buccopharyngeal fascia anterior, anteriorly and the alar fascia posteriorly, as well as knowing that the um, danger space is within the alar fascia anteriorly and the prevertebral fascia posteriorly. Um, what I found confusing is that not many people refer to the buccopharyngeal fascia as pretracheal fascia, which it actually is. Um, and I'm like, where is this fascia coming from? This That's also the same as the alar fascia. So the alar fascia is actually part of the prevertebral fascia. So why this is important is what's connecting these things and things that allow um, infection to spread. So your retropharyngeal space, as we said, once again, just reinforcing it, is between your buccopharyngeal fascia and the pretracheal fascia sorry, of the pretracheal fascia and the alar fascia, fascia of the prevertebral fascia. And it ends at the um, skull base and it terminates at T4. So if we go all the way back to yep, this, it connects um, the base of the skull to T4, which is quite low down in your, um, essentially your nipple line as part of the superior, from the superior mediastinum. The danger space, why it's very uh, dangerous, is that it's from the um, superior border of the diaphragm, so the top of the diaphragm, all the way to your deep cervical, um, also base of the skull. So that's it can see the infection from your diaphragm all the way up, which we have here. Um, and those two um, spaces are key for allowing infections to travel up and down. Um, the prevertebral pre space is essentially um, goes all the way down um, with your back, your um, verte vertebral bodies. So you can imagine that that's really not limited. So you can have um, infections within that space, which really can move a lot up and down. They're not limited. And you can imagine essentially and that in anatomy, natural boxes and borders limit infection. So when you don't have things limiting, that creates a route for infection. I wanted to end slightly on, oh, I've messed this up. Essentially on the um, thy um, thyroid. Maybe we'll touch on this another time because I have managed to um, mess it up but essentially I'll delete this picture and you can look through it in your own time on and you'll also go into the thyroid so many times in the blood supply but they love asking questions about the blood supply of the thyroid I remember in our exam they actually asked a question of where you would do um a th like which um arteries supply the thyroid because it's very vascular vascularized and why the thyroids, they love asking that question is because this, if you take out the thyroid and there's, it's really vascularized and you actually don't stop the bleeding or you don't properly ligate an artery, we go all the way back where's the best, here. Essentially, the fascia creates a limited space within your, um, for your thyroid to expand if there's blood. So if you're having bleeding post taking something up, the only way for the blood in their limited space to move is to start compressing on structures. So in the end, once they, if they take out your thyroid and there's complications with excess bleeding, it essentially will just continually bleed until your trachea is compressed and then you can no longer bleed and you die and obviously you don't want that. So it's another anatomical reason for knowing these spaces but I'm sorry I don't have that um, I've got that picture cutting out all the um, information just maybe review that slide um, but 
that's actually not a key part of this lecture. The key part was the fascial spaces, and we'll touch on the thyroid again. Um, that is my presentation. I hope that was somewhat helpful. Again, just head and neck is really a lot of anatomy, and at the start, it's very overwhelming. So just take your time. Don't be really too hard on yourself at all. Just try, I'd say, from this whole lecture, the main key point would be these fascial spaces, specifically the retropharyngeal and the danger, and also some of those key muscles. So your sternocleidomastoid here, trapezius here, and some of those infrahyoid muscles. And then also, you go all the way back to the start, knowing that your atlas and axis, how they join, and also that the vertebral arteries go through the um, transverse processes there. Foramen, sorry. Um, yeah, so that is my presentation. Feel free to message me if um, you had any questions or anything comes up. All the best.